let's start the discussion with an internal memo in 2022. Back then, we expected the majority of AI use cases will be our ranking system. For example, ads and Instagram. We foresaw that the need for GPU cluster will not go beyond 4K in 2025. Any GPU cluster exceeding 4K will be a bespoken planning procedure. And of course, Gen AI arrives in 23 and then changes all of our forecasts. This is a graph showing the increasing demand of interconnecting more GPUs, especially for large model training. We started out slow from 2020 to 22, believing that the small scale training cluster would be sufficient for our use cases. Then in 23, the demand skyrocketed and quickly became exponential from 23 to 25. Like we mentioned, this is all because of the Gen AI disruption starting 23. Researchers developed a much larger AI models for text, image, and video generation, which in turn needed tens of thousands of GPU for training in the same network. The sudden change was stressing the network even more. Unlike traditional TCP network stack, AI training expects the network to be lossless and also lower latency. To address these challenges, we'll talk about the journey of scaling AI network with DSF, this aggregated schedule fabric. And I'm Ron from FWAS Agent Team. Hi, I am Ankur, Network Engineer at Meta. Before we start with DSF, let's go over the traditional approaches in the cloud space network and some of the existing challenges. I would like to talk about some of the challenges which we have faced with the traditional IP fabrics. The first one being elephant flows. Now these are long duration heavy flows, which has a potential to congest the link it hashes onto and creates heads of the line blocking and stresses switches buffers. The next one being low entropy. Now depending on how many GPUs are involved in the collective operation, there could be very few traditional IP flows, which would mean the hashing would perform poorly and you can still face congestion when there is a lot of capacity available in the fabric. The third one being suboptimal capacity utilization. Now we have observed collectively due to these issues, there is a high skew in bandwidth utilization of fabric links. Now this feeds into the decision of how much we should over provision the fabric to support the ongoing maintenance and keep the fabric unaffected during the failures. We did try some routing solutions, but they did not scale well. For example, we created BGP policies such that any incoming traffic on a leaf switch would be hashed to a predestined fabric link. This helped alleviate the low entropy problem. However, it did not work well in case of failures because the fallback was ECMP. We did try load aware ECMP, but that too did not help. It did help with the low entropy problems and fat flows. However, it was difficult to tune and it created out of order packets, which were which is very bad for RDMA communication. We did created a TE solution, which would pre-compute the traffic flows before a job starts. And it programs the leaf switches such that any incoming traffic is evenly spread over the fabric links. However, due to centralized nature, it was slow to react to the failures and it grew too complex as the network size and the model size grew. So with all this experience, we know that we need a solution which at core of its architecture can solve all these three problems and promises close to optimal load balancing, guarantee no out of order packets, and by design, avoid congestion in the fabric layer. In the rest of the talk, we will talk about how DSF works. We'll talk about DSF dual stage network for Gen AI applications, some of the innovation around how we do failure handling in DSF, and some exciting stuff ahead. So with that, let's move into how DSF works. Let's rewind the clock a little bit and see how we landed on the idea of DSF. There exists a small scale industry solution in the form of routing chassis. The fabric cards and line cards are interconnected with each other within the chassis. However, the size of the chassis limits the size of the network we can build. To achieve a larger scale, we ask ourselves, why don't we break the physical limit of the chassis? Disaggregate the line cards into individual devices 
and build a logically large switch by connecting them into the same domain. This enables us to construct a much larger network and also how DSF earns its first letter D, as in disaggregated. One of the reasons for starting the DSF journey was because we have the experience with both chassis-based system and distributed system. From the early days of building Matters aggregation layer to the current days of distributed network devices within data centers. No one in the industry has attempted this scale where Encore will cover later around the building blocks of DSF and topology for Gen AI. Also know that DSF is smart network fabric and does not require smart NIC. This allows DSF to accommodate the heterogeneity of GPU and AI accelerators. Now let's see what the second letter S, as in schedule, being another characteristic of the network. To understand that, we'll look into the end-to-end -end process of a packet traversing the network from GPU A to GPU B. First, GPU A forwards the packets to RDS of A, which is the disaggregated LAN card interfacing with GPU host. Prior to sending out the packets to the fabric, RDSWA will first send a credit request towards RDSWB, asking, hey, do you have enough credit or enough buffer to accept the packet? If yes, RDSWB will grant credit back to RDSWA saying, yes, I do have enough buffer to accommodate your packet. This is the reason for being a scheduled fabric, as it's using credit-based congestion control algorithm. To ensure optimal usage of the fabric links, RDSWA will break the packets into smaller cells and spread it across all available FDSWs here, which are disaggregated fabric cards. They will forward the cells to the destination RDSWB in which the packet will be reassembled and finally handed over to destination GPUB. With the schedule fabric understood, let's see how we scale the AI network with DSF, especially for Gen AI use cases. Using DSF technology, we first built the DSF fabric for non-Gen AI applications. We announced it at last year in the OCP. Please check it out for more details. In today's talk, we will however focus on DSF for Gen AI applications. What we are looking at is a single DSF AI zone. Consider this as a building block for larger Gen AI clusters. I know there is a lot going on this slide, but let's try to dissect and understand it better. We divide this AI zone into multiple scaling units. Each scaling unit consists of GPU racks connected to the RDSW switches in a rail optimized fashion. And each RDSW in the AI zone is connected to the common fabric layer of FDSWs. To support the scale, we created two planes which are symmetrical to each other. Now let's look at a traffic walk. Let's imagine there is a traffic which stays within the scaling unit, within the rail. It gets switched at one single hop at the RDSW. That is really beneficial for the PRKL collectives like all gather and all reduce, which are very latency sensitive. In case traffic has to exit the rail or exit the scaling unit, the ingress RDSW converts the IP packet into the cells and spray it smoothly over the fabric. The egress RDSW will collect all the cells convert it into the IP packet and forward it to the egress RDSW. Now you may have noticed DSF is free from IP, IP flows. One flow or more, it really does not matter. And the fabric is also utilized pretty evenly. Now together, this AI zone gives a scale of 4.6K 800 gig GPUs. To build larger, we connected four AI zones via a second layer of spine, which we call STSWs. These STSWs are the same hardware as FTSW, just doing a different function. Now, collectively, these four AI zones behave as one single DSF scheduled fabric. Collectively, it provides a scale of 18K 800 gig GPUs. Now to put into the perspective, this takes up to one whole building, leaving space for front-end services and some supported services. 18K is good, but to support larger models, we interconnected five such buildings using a special pod called EdgePod, 
which consists of 40 fabric devices and 128 EDSW switches. Each EDSW switch connects by 16800 gig links to the layer 3 super spine, providing a total capacity of 2800 gig links to enter and exit the building. Now, as you may notice, the layer 3 spine is oversubscribed at 4.5 is to 1. This is because depending on how we shard our models and map the parallelisms, there is very less traffic which egresses the building. Now, because it's a layer 3 super spine, we need to exchange routing information. We do that by running BGP between EDSWs and all the RDSWs inside the building and EBGP between EDSW and layer 3 super spine. All the routing information is summarized and we only announce aggregates via the building. Let's get a packet walk. Let's imagine there is a GPU 1 which wants to send traffic to GPU B. Now it sends a packet to its directly connected RDSW, which in turn converts the packet into the cells and forward it towards the EDSW devices. EDSW collects all the cells and forward the IP packet to the layer 3 super spine, which in turn sends the packet back to the EDSW, which will again reverse, convert the IP packet into the cells, forward it to the egress RDSW, which will again collect all the cells, regroup it into an IP packet and forward it to the GPU B. Now this is a massive network. It will be interesting to see how we manage failures in such a great scale. It's all fun and games until failures occur in the network. Like we mentioned before, spraying the packet across the fabric guarantees optimal utilization of the network. However, in the face of remote link failure, severe congestion could occur in the fabric layer and spine layer. There have been attempts to solve this problem at the source and destination of GPU hosts, but balance input mode is an innovation in DSF that can optimally balance the traffic throughout the network. Such capability allows the network to be GPU and NIC agnostic. The idea of input balance mode is pretty straightforward. Any devices should have equal or less input bandwidth compared to output bandwidth. No oversubscription should occur in the network, even in the case of remote link failures. Devices experiencing link failure will propagate this information and notify other devices to send proportionally less traffic. Let's take a closer look on how it works. Imagine we have this mini scale DSF network with two AI zones connecting by SDSW0 and SDSW1. In the pristine state, all links of the network will be utilized for optimal load balancing. Now, a link failure occurred in the AI zone 1 on the right hand side, disconnecting RDSW3 and FDSW1. From FDSW1's perspective, it's losing 100% reachability towards RDSW3. This information will be populated to SDSW1 and SDSW2, both realizing they can no longer reach RDSW3 via FDSW1. This is where input balance mode kicks in. Because SDSWs are losing 50% output capacity, maintaining the same input capacity will cause congestion in the spine layer. In order to relieve that situation, each of the SDSW will select 50% of the input links and stop advertising reachability on those links. Let's say SDSW0 stop advertising reachability on the two links towards FDSW0 on the left hand side, and the same happens between SDSW1 and FDSW1. After this, input capacity and output capacity will be balanced on the spine layer. The same algorithm takes place on FDSW, making it stop advertising reachability on 50% of the downlinks. When the protocol converges, all layers of the network are losing 50% capacity to send traffic towards RDSW3 in AI zone 1. This is equal to the percentage connection loss on RDSW3 itself, which is 50% with the, with the DSF network. With this feature, 
we relieve the buffer utilization in fabric and spine layer, ensuring no congestion will occur in the face of remote link failures. I'm sure we just poured a lot of information and hopefully you find it interesting. Let's see some of the results of DSF and some of the exciting future works. To share some bits on the DSF fabric performance, this graph shows the bus bandwidth of all to all collective run on a GPU size of 128, 256, and 512. We are comparing bus bandwidth observed within an AI zone and inter zone connected via dual stage spine. All to all is a very bandwidth intensive collective, and as you can see, that we can comfortably reach theoretical roof line in both the cases. Now this graph shows the performance of a Gen AI job running over an intrazone and interzone, again connected via dual stage spine. In both the cases, it shows the same performance. Now let's talk about some exciting stuff which we are doing. We are interconnecting multiple DC regions to connect a mega cluster. This will bring an interesting problem of heterogeneity of different GPUs and fabric switching technologies. As you may have noticed, we are using IP interconnects, which again introduces the same problems we discussed in the beginning of the talk. We are also working on a technology called Hyperports, which will combine multiple 800 gig ports at the ASIC level to act as a single physical port. This will reduce the effect of fat flows on the IP interconnects. Lastly, DSF is a smart fabric which inherently supports a wide range of GPU NICs. We are increasing our deployments to include an increasing variety of GPU NIC models. Thanks for listening.